It's the largest ocean, and it covers the planet. Many miles above our heads, the atmosphere gradually becomes cold, black space. We live at the bottom of this ocean, where it's defined by earth and water. Looking up, we see a big blue sky. It fuels our hopes, our dreams, our passions. Through man's conquest of the air, we learn that flying is serious business, as serious as warfare or commerce. To the pilot, flight is a personal experience fueled by curiosity, passion, and dreams. It's an ancient dream, a dream to fly like a bird. 1971 was an extraordinary time. It was a time of Cold War, Vietnam, hippies, Charlie Manson, Evil Knievel, and Jonathan Livingston Seagull. Astronauts were exploring the mountains of the moon, and just four years after the summer of love, mankind grew wings. On May 23, 1971, a small group of enthusiasts gathered on a hillside in Newport Beach, California, for the first hang gliding meet to be held in decades. It was the first extreme sport. It wasn't about trying to get some air, it was all air. The seeds for a new chapter in aviation history were planted that sunny spring day in the midst of the culture that gave birth to hot rodding and surfing. The time for hang gliding had come. I think that uh, the early enthusiasm by uh, the Woodstock generation of uh, baby boomers was a significant event in itself. Just the, just the market size, the, the sheer volume of people that uh, were out there that wanted to try this new fangled thing where you could jump off of a mountain, foot launch it, no less, like a model airplane in a way, like throwing it into the air, and literally fly yourself to another place down the hill. That was a dream that uh, has been with mankind for thousands of years. The enthusiasm of the, uh, the baby boomers and the Woodstock generation just took hang gliding and just burst it wide open. Man's earliest flights were done in hang gliders. They were called hang gliders because the pilot would actually hang on. In the late 1880s, aviation pioneers built simple craft to test their aeronautical theories. Otto Lilienthal, John J. Montgomery, Octave Chanute, and the Wright brothers. The Wright brothers refined their craft, making hundreds of flights in their 1902 glider. The Wright brothers' successful powered flight on December 17, 1903, effectively killed hang gliding. In 1948, during the post-war baby boom, Dr. Francis Regalo designed a revolutionary new type of wing a personal wing that would mature along with the baby boomers. He was trying to figure out how to create a wing that would allow inexpensive man flight. The, the solution he found to that problem was the flexible wing. That's what he thought would, would work. It really is a revolutionary idea uh, and extremely significant in aviation. He understood that it had very powerful applications and he wanted it to be used. Uh, it was the most important thing for the, the Regalos at the, is that the invention be utilized by the public and, and really uh, be a benefit to mankind. And, and he saw that uh, you know, the best way to accomplish that was through NASA. And so he gave them the patent so that there would be no problems with the research being done on the wing and so that the, so that the information would get out there and it would be of great benefit to mankind. The space race brought Dr. Regala's dream of a personal wing for mankind one step closer. The Regalas never profited directly from their invention. Their only reward was seeing the joy their invention brought to so many people. Photographs of NASA's research projects appeared in magazines, sparking worldwide interest in the flexible wing. In 1961, Barry Palmer was a young aeronautical engineer living in Northern California. Barry built a Regala wing hang glider from aluminum tubing, polyethylene plastic sheeting, and tape. He first flew it in December of 1961. 
I first flew it at a place called La Trobe, California. It's uh, northeast of Sacramento, and it may be on the map, but I don't think there's a town there at all. We just went out in some cattle rancher's field, shooed the cows off the top of the hill, which had a cluster of trees on it, and started our gliding. Our first few flights were more like parachuting affairs. We never really got the tail up and went, but after about uh, three days of these attempts, we finally got it up and flying. And uh, we were a little surprised, if anybody was, that it flew so well. We had no problems at all flying this machine. And our flights ranged up to 80 feet in altitude and they ranged maybe 200, 250 yards long, and that was about all your armpits could take. In 1964, Barry Palmer received a letter from Richard Miller inquiring about his hang gliders. Richard Miller learned of Palmer's gliders from Francis Regalo. In the early 1960s, Richard Miller was interested in yoga, Eastern religions, and kinesiology long before these things were common knowledge. Richard knew and influenced a lot of people. His build is kind of bird-like, kind of tall and skinny, and kind of, kind of long in the nose, as I recall. And, uh, and even, in, even when he was you know, younger, uh, the meat time, a little, he seemed a little frail, you know, kind of, because he, he was a vegetarian a lot of the time, and even a, like a fruit and nutitarian. And he was very... Uh, uh, he had a very strong spiritual side. I mean, he was kind of like half pilot, half uh, Indian sadhu, you know. He had this sort of holy man side that was very strong, and you could, you could easily imagine him like sitting under some tree in India, you know, just... <clears throat> he had a very broad uh, kind of, you know, interest in, a, in exploring, uh, you know, these v broader realms, and, the, and the, this, the, the flying was kind of like part of that. It was sort of one foot in the material plane, but also a large spiritual element, and, and a very, I mean, a very brilliant, capable guy. In early 1966, Richard Miller was living in Los Angeles and finally got around to finishing his Regalo hang glider he called the Bamboo Butterfly. He and several friends flew a hundred or so flights that winter near Los Angeles International Airport. Lloyd Leicher and Dr. Paul McCready also flew Miller's wing. They would all have a strong influence on hang gliding in the years to come. Half a world away, Australian John Dickinson was already building flexible wing ski kites, built to be towed behind a boat. He is credited with the most revolutionary adaptation for the soon-to-be hang glider, the triangular control bar. His concept for the structure of the kite and his method for control are still used for hang gliders today. Fellow Australian Bill Bennett brought Dickinson's ski kite to America, claiming to have developed it. Here, Bill Bennett explains the true origins of the ski kite. They used to have a ski show at, uh, in Grafton, and he was one of the skiers and he used to fly a fat kite. And people would always come to the ski show to see the kite fly, for one thing, because they invariably or almost always crashed, and very spectacular crashes and so on. So this year they asked him to build a different kind of glider, and that's when he saw Francis Regalo's uh, uh, idea, and he, he uh, uh, duplicated that, but he also developed, the, he was watching his daughter swing on a swing from the one uh, pendulum point, and he said, that's it. I didn't think he was particularly interested in, in the Delta Wing, you know. Um, so we just uh, went ahead and formed the company. When I came to America, hanging on the wall in there, I applied for and got a patent on the tow kite. It's still on the wall there. And in all truthfulness, the patent belongs to John Dickinson. You know, if anybody uh, deserved the patent, he did. The, the credit belongs to John Dickinson. Bill Bennett's travels brought him to Marine World in Redwood City, California, where Dave Kilborn performed in the water ski show. This guy named Bill Bennett shows up and he brings this funny looking thing called a delta wing. He called it a delta wing kite. And I knew immediately it was a regalo. I thought he was going to die. 
because, uh, you know, the flat kites, if you ever cut them loose, they just fall like a leaf. You know, no way you could glide them. And, uh, but I saw it glide and he picked up speed, came down, flared it out, ran up on the beach. Couldn't believe it. The control that he had, it was just, you know, totally, um, you know, beyond anything that we had ever seen. I had the idea, the first time I saw it glide, I said, if you can glide it, you can soar it. So from that moment, that was my intent. I said, I want to soar that thing. We've got to get rid of this rope, just towing it around the boats, you know. <laughs> it's okay and it's fun, but to fly free is it, you know, that's the dream. After meeting Bill Bennett, Dave Kilborn started building his own kites and began running off of hills, foot launching them. Dave made the kites bigger so it wouldn't require a gale force wind to get them airborne. While Dave Kilborn was foot launching in Northern California, the hang gliding movement was just getting started in Southern California. Joe Faust was an Olympian high jumper with an interest in kites. His research led him to the Soaring Society of America and an introduction to Richard Miller and Lloyd Leitcher. Joe Faust's attention shifted from kites and high jumping to hang gliding. What high jumping meant to me really is uh, theocentric flying. I interpreted my mathematics and high jumping as a, a meditational, prayerful path in my life. And so the flight, the tension to fly, the steps to heaven had to tie in as the way of living. And so hang gliding, the flight dream, tied right in with the high jumping. On one's own power, gifted as grace, take off and go to the heavens. And so hang gliding was exact natural extension of the high jumping. And I gave it the same energy. I sublimated the same thoughts, the same athletic energy, and the same meditational energy. So I wrote about hang gliding and encouraged it. Joe Faust picked up an old mimeograph machine from Lloyd Leitcher at the Soaring Society of America and started printing a newsletter called Low and Slow, an updated continuation of a newsletter called Low, Slow, and Out of Control that Richard Miller had once produced. As I developed the Low and Slow booklet series, uh, right away, an idea came to have a, a first meet in remembrance of the Otto Lilienthal. And so uh, a confluence of ideas came just snap, snap, snap from Jack Lambie, Richard Miller, and myself to have the May 23rd uh, birthday party in Newport Beach. Uh, we looked at several sites, Jack Lambie's site uh, in Newport Beach was finally settled upon. In 1970, Jack Lambie taught a summer school class. He and the sixth graders built a hang glider they named Hang Loose, based on a design dating from the 1880s. The Hang Loose was featured on the cover of Plane and Pilot magazine and generated a lot of interest. I located this site off MacArthur Boulevard down towards Newport Beach, and it was a Pacific View Memorial Cemetery's dedicated land. Well, they made the mistake of not posting it. It was right off of, uh, you know, pretty easy to get to, faced into the ocean breezes, uh, kind of an ideal hill, very gentle slope. The flying party, billed as the Great Universal Hang Glider Championships, would celebrate the 123rd birthday of hang gliding and flight pioneer Otto Lilienthal. Sunday, May 23, 1971, started as a cool, overcast day. Several participants had camped out the night before and were up early assembling their machines. Everybody just showed up with their little gang, their wine, their picnic, their blankets spread out on the hill and we just started doing it. After about two, three hours of this, MacArthur Boulevard was completely backed up with traffic. There was probably close to a thousand people around the bottom of the hill. And then of course the police came and see what this was all about and we had the helicopter overhead and the bullhorns will be uh, 
organizers of this event, you know, come down in a police car. Jack sent me down and I gave them what Jack Lambie referred to as Faust speak in one of his articles. I took care of the police. <laughs> So at that point, the, the police all backed off and everything, and uh, it was quite a fun day. Lots of cameras going, lots of pictures, and uh, people trying it out and crashing, and nobody nobody got hurt at all that I can recall. That afternoon, hang gliding was introduced to the world. A dozen or so hang gliders provided nonstop entertainment. The hang loose biplane gliders were the most spectacular to watch since the pilot had little or no control of the craft. The most amazing glider flown there was Richard Miller's visionary Conduit Condor. This small wing was a glimpse at the future of hang gliding. Paris Kucinic brought the Batso, an adaptation of Richard Miller's Bamboo Butterfly. Terrace let several people fly it, including Dr. Paul McCready. I don't recall the details of the flight other than it was mercifully short. Just went up gently, came down, but it seemed like you were really flying and being able to just run on the ground and take off. That is Pretty amazing. The meet was a huge success, stirring interest in hang gliding worldwide. It was the day the modern hang gliding movement began. Over the next few months, Joe Faust organized another eight fun fly events in the Los Angeles area. If you went by the beach, you were bound to see someone trying to fly something and maybe get involved yourself, as Dave Cronk did. And I was down at Torrance Beach one day and uh, saw these guys jumping down these sand dunes on these little bamboo and plastic kite type contraptions. So, uh, so I started to get interested in that. In the meantime, I've, I'm you know, supporting this family with this, with this uh, real conservative style job and you know, good future in front of me. So, uh, so I started to get more and more interested in what these guys are doing with these kites. And, and I, I, I go ahead and build my own to my own design and start flying. And pretty soon this kind of takes over my whole life. My first flights were at Torrance Beach. Torrance Beach is about an 80 foot, about an 80 foot uh, hill, you know, 30 degree slope. Uh, we always had a constant sea breeze. Perfect place to learn. Go up to the top of the hill. As we got bolder, we would go to the top and fly off. And, and occasionally one of the wing spars would break you might fall 10, 20 feet onto a nice sandy slope, so big laugh, you know, it was hilarious. Kronk and others were just beginning to fly in Southern California, satisfied with flights that simply made it all the way to the bottom of the hill. Dave Kilborn was now making extended soaring flights, staying up on rising air. Here, Dave describes his first soaring flight, which lasted 15 to 20 minutes. Well, if I take off, I'm going up. There's no doubt about that. I'm going to soar today, you know. But it could be the last flight in my life, you know? and and I had to think about that. I sat there for 20 minutes, and I go, I want to do it. But one thing that I thought of was, if I do it, and it's successful, there's going to be a lot of other guys that'll follow, and some of them are going to kill themselves. And I had to think, would I be responsible for that? And I just meditated on that and I thought about it. And it was like clearly it came to me. That's their life, not mine. Whatever happens to them, whatever they do, whatever I do, that's their life and this is my life. You know, I'm going for it. And then I thought that, that night, you know, I, uh, I thought about it and I go, oh man, well, I was really lucky, you know. I'll probably never do that again. You know, I mean, hell, it could have killed me, you know. I did it, that was my goal, I accomplished it, I soared, but God, that's too scary, I'll never do that again. 
Well, you know what happened. Next, next time the wind blew, I was right back up there. <laughs> and uh, so I kept, I just kept doing it. Did my hour flight on September 6, 1971. And uh, I, had, I had already been doing, you know, little short soar, soaring flights at, on the Mission Peak and down at the Low Ridge. And uh, I went water skiing one day and it was blown out. Too much wind. You know, and as I was driving home, I came by the I came by the Mission Peak, and uh, I could see that it was was really good. I went up there, and uh, launched, and did an hour. I just I set my stopwatch on it, you know, and uh, away I went. After the Lilienthal meet, Taurus Kasenik decided to build a better hang glider. His father suggested a flying wing, so young Taurus researched, designed, and then built the Icarus I. Its performance was much better than the Batso, and it was fully controllable. On Sunday, October 10, 1971, he brought the wing to Torrance Beach. It was one of the informal fun fly gatherings that Joe Faust had instigated. And as several bamboo bombers tried to simply make it to the water's edge, Taurus soared. So I went up to that little bluff and uh, took off off there, and uh, there was enough lift to, to start climbing right away. So I turned down towards the Palos Verdes and just went down, and made one pass, turned around, and came back, and was probably about 30 or 40 feet above takeoff point when I came by. And of course, everybody there. Had hadn't really seen anything like that before. <laughs> I was like, and neither had I, so I was like, pretty stoked. So that was like a momentous, you know, flight. Eight months after the first Lilienthal meet at Newport Beach, the February 1972 issue of National Geographic magazine had an article on the meet. By this time, coverage of the first extreme sport was extensive. One day I saw a National Geographic that had a picture of the Batso with Taras flying it, and uh, I knew that's how I could fly on my budget. And so we basically built a glider in one day based on the Dimensions using a ruler and on the National Geographic magazine. The first time I actually got airborne, uh, I was probably in the air two or three seconds. But in my brain, it was hours. And in my brain, I was suddenly free. And I was taking steps on the ground, and then pretty soon I was still taking steps, but it wasn't on the ground. And then it was just like the dream. It was like I'd always thought it should be. I was just flying. And uh, I remember it vividly, absolutely. Chris Wills, his brother Bob Wills, and their friend Chris Price, like other hang glider pioneers, taught themselves how to build and fly their own hang gliders over the next several months. These three quickly became widely recognized for their excellent flying skills and daring showmanship. By now, Dave Kronk was designing and building his own flying contraptions and soaring them. Dave describes his early experiences soaring the cliffs connecting Torrance Beach and Redondo Beach. We used to soar along this hill at night, and uh, it was pretty spectacular. When, when the wind got good, we could get 100 feet above this little slope in these plastic things. And uh, there were big light standards right along the ridge here, and you'd, you'd get up and, you know, whoa, and your tip might brush against one of these light standards. <laughs> And uh, you would get so hyped up, we would be down there in, you know, t-shirts, maybe slaps on. Wind would be bone 30, it might be 50 degrees, and you were so hyped up, you weren't even aware of the, of the conditions. I'd come home to my wife, <laughs> you know, 11 o'clock, completely filthy, head to toe, uh, bruised up, bashed up, narrowly missed death 50 times, and you know, where have you been? All right. Just out with my friends. <laughs> I got interested in hang gliding, driving down Pacific Coast Highway one day and looking over to the ocean just about El Segundo Boulevard 
and here was this giant sand dune, and there were a bunch of guys up on the top of it with gliders. So the guy said, do you want to fly it? And I said, absolutely. So he explained how everything worked, and I had no idea anything about flight. I mean, I had no real connection with flight at all, but he explained the whole thing and uh, hooked in and uh, took off and had a really good first flight. And I got down to the bottom and I said, this has got to be more fun than anything I've ever done. I mean, it was really, I was so stoked on it. People all over the United States were starting to hang glide. All you needed was some materials, plans, and a hill to fly from. If you knew what you were doing, you could build your own machine for a few dollars, and in the course of day, teach yourself how to soar. These fellows did just that, and it looks like their whole day cost less than $5, including lunch, gas money, and the glider. There's a passion that you get for it immediately. As soon as you understand that, you know, you can do it. I've kind of looked at myself as the average woman, if you will, and, and here I was able to, I was able to do it. You could safely do this sport. And as soon as you got that you could do that, I mean, how could you let that go? You're on top of the world. Hang glider manufacturers and training schools started to pop up all over the country. They offered lessons, plans, kits, and complete gliders. For a few hundred bucks, you could have your own glider and be in the air. Some designs were safe, some were not. In the very early days, somebody would buy a kit or a glider, go out and fly it on the weekend, became a pilot. His brother wanted to fly next week, so he became an instructor. The next week, they'd break a leading edge or a keel, they'd build it up and stop, so they became a manufacturer. Like, all within a month. It wasn't very competitive in the beginning because there was everyone, there was so many customers to, to go around, there was no competition. And we always got along good at the beats. We would share information, share, share construction materials. If someone was low on Dacron, we would grad, gladly trade, or aluminum or whatever. I would say it was a real family-type relationship with all the manufacturers. And then later on it got a little competitive, but, it, but we had a good relationship. We would all party together at the, uh, at the meets. We had a good time. Everybody tried to work together. Everybody was generally supportive and wanted to see everybody do well. I thought that our competition was against ourselves to be successful, not against the other people. And uh, yeah, I didn't want to see anybody get hurt. The Federal Aviation Administration didn't want to see anybody get hurt either. But how do you go about regulating something like hang gliding, a sport where anybody, anywhere, can jump off anything and commit an act of aviation? Jack Limby's brother Mark describes what happened to him after the first Lilienthal meet. The next day I went into work at El Toro when I was working for the FAA and they put me in an office with two inspectors and started grilling me with this, and they actually had already prepared a, a vile flight violation thing of flying unlicensed aircraft, flying in the air traffic area of Orange County Tower, um, flying disabled or broken airplanes that had been patched, uh, flying in the vicinity of crowds, and so on and so forth. And um, the only way I'd kind of thought about at the time of getting out of this, I told them, well, we were tethered, and their eyes just lit up. That was what they wanted to hear that we were operating under the different section of the FARs under kites. And at that point, they just basically closed the book on it and left and let it go. Lloyd Leitcher had known Richard Miller for years and helped organize the first Lilienthal meet in 1971. He was the executive director of the Soaring Society of America, a group focused on sailplanes. Lloyd Leitcher was instrumental in the formation of the United States Hang Gliding Association and served as its president for several years. However, the Soaring Society was not happy with Lloyd. As executive director of the Soaring Society of America with heavy responsibilities there, I saw hang gliding as a means for people to get into 
flying on a very inexpensive basis. The board of directors of the Soaring Society thought otherwise, unfortunately. They thought there was quite a strong conflict of interest there. And it came up to a, a vote at one of the board meetings. But cooler heads prevailed, so I was sort of free to uh, keep involved with hang gliding, which I did. I thought the experience of the soaring community would be of good benefit to these people. So I was really disappointed that the Soaring Society didn't get more involved because they had this world of experience. Conceived during the space race and born with the help of the Soaring Society of America, hang gliding was now the unwanted love child of aviation. In spite of this abandonment, hang gliding continued to grow. As the sport grew, each local flying site developed a devoted group of pilots with flying styles and gliders to match the unique local flying conditions. From smooth air at the coastal sites to rowdy thermals inland, pilots adapted. The slogans low and slow and don't fly higher than you want to fall were soon forgotten as pilots flew their hang gliders off of every mountain they could get to the top of, daring to go faster and farther. Donita Hall learned to fly ski kites with Dave Kilborn and also transitioned to foot launching in the San Francisco Bay Area, just as the hang gliding movement in Southern California began. And it was really coincidental to our activity, really. I mean, we, it, we, almost in parallel, the Northern California, Southern California were, de, were, were doing this. Foot launched uh, hang gliders. I have to say that, of course, we felt very superior to the Southern California. We're towing this thing at 35 more miles an hour, 500 feet over the, the boat or the car, whatever we were using. Um, and, and that's what we had our expertise in. This foot launching, of course, we were very novice in. And so the Southern California thing was ahead of us in that regard. But of course, our, our first hills, I mean, we, we, we went for altitude immediately. We were lowing and slowing anything. <laughs> we were, you know, get out there where there's no, nothing to run into. The Northern California gliders evolved directly from the ski kites and were small and fast. The Southern California gliders were larger, made to fly in lighter breezes. So Bob came up to Coyote Hills, a little place that's right on the, the south end of the bay in San Francisco, put together this big monstrosity kite. So he launches this thing, and it is aerial ballet. And he's talking to us as he's, he's, he's going, passing by, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet above us. And, and he can talk to us, and he's playful. He's throwing this control bar around, just tossing this thing around. And we were stunned. We, we had never envisioned anything like this. Kind of maybe got over our smug superior attitude of Northern California, Southern California. Maybe just a little bit came down a notch. <laughs> Taras Kasenik continued to amaze people with his feats. He may be the first person to gain some real altitude in a hang glider at a site near Palmdale, California, flying his Icarus II. Took off somewhere up near the top there, and uh, could see there was plenty of lift right away, and I started like spiraling and lift, and I gained, oh, you know, 1,500 feet or so above launch. I was like a little tiny speck up there. That would have been the first time I think anybody had probably ever done that in a hang glider. Well, you know, there's a certain amount of the clench factor at times. It depends on where, you know, if you, like when I'm really into the soaring thing, I'm watching the variometer and you know, feeling the bumps and stuff. And then, and then after I kind of got out of that, I'm just cruising around and going, it's, it's 2,000 feet down. What am, what am I doing up here? <laughs> but it was, you know, I don't know, it was, it was exhilarating. Tara soon turned his attention toward an even higher performance wing. This one, a monoplane flying wing, the Icarus V. The Icarus V was another leap forward in performance. The fixed wing hang gliders were more work to build, transport, and handle on the ground, so the majority of the hang glider pilots still preferred the simple, flexible wing designs. In the early 1970s, 
Fixed wing hang glider designs like the Icarus 2, Icarus 5, Quicksilver, and Volmer Jensen's VJ23 had a huge performance advantage over the flexible wing designs. The flexible wing hang gliders would soon outperform these early fixed wing gliders, and what drove the level of performance upward was competition. Well, originally it was like a, a B-in where people would just get together and uh, there wasn't any competition. And I think that was the grooviest time in retrospect. And then we would compete just for, uh, you know, the uh, longest flights and the best flights were the, the prize themselves. And I remember when we had the first contest where money was involved and I thought it kind of ruined it, the concept. Free flying hang gliding was a bunch of free flying people who didn't want a bunch of rules for the most part. The uh, competitions initially were pretty disorganized. What really changed all that was a cheap wine company called Annie Greensprings. And they thought, well, what's better for a cheap wine than something dangerous like hang gliding? So they wanted to organize a uh, hang gliding competition. And since they wanted to have it uh, be publicized and get lots of press, they decided they needed to have it be official, and so it became the first U.S. National Championship. The first U.S. Nationals was actually the first competition that was really an organized competition. In 1973, just two years after hang gliding was introduced, the sport was about to determine its first national champion at Silmar, California. First meet I went to in California was the Annie Green Springs Nationals, 1973. I was the youngest participant. I was in uh, junior year of high school, and I had to get uh, special permission to leave school to go. And, uh, it was a really incredible thing. One of the reasons that we won, and I say we, meaning. Bobby and me and Chris Price is because we studied the rules. We knew the rules. I knew the rules. I had them memorized. I knew them by heart. And we had a strategy in all of our first competitions uh, that we thought was guaranteed to win, and it turns out did win. Taurus Gesenek showed up at the Annie Green Springs meet with his new Icarus 5 and put on quite a show. He took off and gained thousands of feet of altitude, drifting above and behind the mountain in the process. Well, nobody had seen, you know, a hang glider spiral up out of sight and go back over the mountain before, so it's, though there were standard regalos spiraling and gaining altitude on that day. A lot of people got um, seriously excited. Hang, this hang gliding was beginning to realize that it, was, it had access to that full kind of soaring envelope and it was getting away from the sort of, you know, the more the surfer model of, of uh, mindset and more into the soaring pilot's mindset. And that, you know, just led in a few years to just, uh, just amazing growth in, in uh, technology and uh, performance of the, of the gliders. In the mid-1970s, there were hang gliding meets all over the country. Every weekend was a new adventure. Almost every weekend was, was almost history making. So many things that we did, no one had tried before. We did some pretty crazy things this was my early 20s and it was it was so prevalent during the first years I kind of started feeling like oh this is normal life <laughs> it was just so exciting and exciting to read about the other pilots in uh, other parts of the country who were doing uh, also incredible uh, pioneering events seeing what 
somebody else had developed that afternoon or that week or they'd all go home and try the variations on it. That, that focus on the technology brought the sport along so quickly. And even though we were competing, uh, all these ideas were still being shared as well. It was uh, an art form back then. And it, uh, it definitely brought out the curious and the kooky. Uh, but they were great people. And in comparison, the rest of my life has been a disappointment. And so to me, it was like uh, being surrounded by gods. Because remember, I was a little kid. I was 16 years old. So it was all incredible stuff for me. That's why I remember it so well. Because it wasn't, there wasn't other things that were competing for attention. I didn't play baseball. I've never played golf. I, you know, it, it's all it's ever been. Bob Wills won contest after contest all over the country, set records for endurance and altitude, and quickly soared to Sky God status. One of the first contests I went to with Bob was a place called Grand Targhee. Um, it was a wintertime meet where we were foot launching off snow. And he, uh, he never used to wear shoes. He was flying barefooted. Up in the mountains, I don't know, we were probably seven, eight thousand, nine thousand 9,000 feet. And he would uh, walk around all day in, a, in his bare feet, just a t-shirt on. It may have been in the 20s. And he would uh, foot launch barefooted. And, you know, he'd, he'd always do well at these meets. And he would go into town, we'd go into town for dinner and partying after the contest, and he was barefoot with his t-shirt on. <laughs> uh, so he, he was a wonderful character. Bob Wills was my hero when I was a kid. And uh, he was always really, really nice to me. Yeah. Hey, Pagini, wanna come with me and roll some rocks down the hill? You know, kind of stuff. And uh, he was such a natural. He was a big kid himself and was always really nice to me. And the whole Wills family was really nice to me as well. Bobby was uh, probably the epitome of a I'm going to do it my way type of rebel. Uh, he wasn't an in-your-face type of rebel. He just wanted to do things that no one else had done. The top pilots had a lot in common. In addition to being excellent pilots, they all designed and test flew the gliders their companies produced. Like Tom Pagini, Roy Haggard was also a teenager at that time. Roy was the guy that really, uh, as far as I'm concerned, really modernized hang gliding with our original Dragonfly. And uh, it was Roy's expertise combined with the hardware that we were able to develop. We came out with a product that was, you know, really way, way ahead of anything else that had been done. And of course, Roy could fly anything. He was uh, just an incredible pilot. And he was just, you know, a little geeky teenage kid at that time. Not all the noted designers were teenagers. Tom Price brought his aeronautical engineering and sailmaking skills to hang gliding. Roy's always been innovative. He was a little kid, like Tom Pagini. I can remember I'm 10 years older than those guys, and in those days they were like 17, 18 years old. Well, I was a 30-year-old man. They were just little punks back then. <laughs> By 1975, the sport had spread worldwide. In the Tyrolean Alps in Kosen, Austria, the first World Hang Gliding Championships took place. The American hang gliders were the best in the world at that time. I think it was about a 1,500 foot, 2,000 foot mountain that we were flying off of. Um, very simple rules at the time, pretty primitive by today's standards, but basically it was uh, time aloft, spot landing, uh, distance around the course, it was basic stuff. And uh, We had about maybe 10 Americans that had gone over there and, and there, were, there were other teams from most of the European countries. I don't know, 300, 400 competitors maybe. It was a pretty big deal for the time. And luckily I had brought a, a prototype that I had just finalized a week before I left and it was, it was pretty hot. 
And so I had a pretty good advantage on everybody there. But I, I won first place. Nicknamed Mr. Smooth, David Kronk was the first world champion. Hang gliding became a lifestyle. Each flying site had its own group of locals. You could instantly recognize who was in the air by that person's flying style, the type of glider they were flying, and the unique colors of the sail. It was all about getting air. It was such an incredible era of uh, people doing things together and uh, a community that was there. And the, uh, the, the focus that everybody had on trying to make the sport better, safer, sharing it, uh, and the friendships that you developed during that time we were so close. And the first thing you did in the morning when you got up, I mean, you just barely get out. The first thing you do is you go to the window and look out and see what the conditions were, because <laughs> that was going to determine what your day was going to be like. It wasn't whether you were going to work or anything like that, because nobody really worked. It was all a lifestyle about flying. I started out on a trip to just to relax and go around Palo Verde's Peninsula with my wife. And we got to Torrance Beach and saw all these kites in the air and had a camera with me and I got out and shot a few of them and decided, well, I better get some more film, sent the wife home to get it. And then I went down on the beach and started shooting landings and uh, half the guys that landed on the beach uh, were surfers that I knew. You'd go around the country and you'd find little enclaves of pilots who were nice people and uh, as interested as you were in the same kinds of things, flying higher, farther, faster, better, safer. And we didn't have much money and uh, I know I lived for years out of my truck just, uh, just getting enough money for gasoline and food. So, you know, there are people who have, have been around a long time and are still friends, and I think it's partly because of the, the shared risks, um, the mutual respect, and poverty. Hang gliding changed people. They developed a deep passion for flying, their only desire to fly as much as possible. Well, it was a visceral experience. <laughs> To have the wind in your face and your body, it's as close to being a bird as you can get, I think. That first day that I uh, soared thermals in Elsinore and was able to stay up for, you know, more than an hour or two hours was just absolutely a mind-blowing experience. Because when you're doing it, you're concentrating so hard on flying and staying in the thermal uh, and <laughs> realizing that you're actually going back up. Uh, was just so incredibly exciting. And then uh, the continued flight, then really getting into strong thermals and realizing that you were really getting some altitude and getting up over 10,000 feet was just absolutely more fun than anything I've ever done. Still the best thing I've ever done. Better than any race car I've ever driven. <laughs> you know, we all have flying dreams. Well, hang gliding is the flying dream. And and uh, because your, your body is soaring through the atmosphere and, and you're launching from your feet and landing on your feet. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very pure form of flight. I can remember before when I dropped out of aerospace sitting on the cliffs of Torrey Pines watching seagulls. I wanted to be in that seagull's body. And sure enough, eventually I was at Torrey Pines and I was in that seagull's body. It was really cool. Really cool. I was born dreaming about flying. My earliest dreams I can remember were dreams of flying. And uh, um, my favorite dream was always just stepping off the side of a hill and flying. Now it didn't involve any uh, contraptions, it was just me flying. Uh, for me, it was a way to find my freedom offered me a total freedom that I found on the road and in the sky and nothing else has ever given me quite that same sense of freedom. The experience of being way up in the air all by yourself is, is, a, is a lot different than you know hanging out in a, in a crowded schoolroom. so there's a it broadens out a, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's another point of view to look at the universe from so I think that in that sense it, it, it's, it's broadening 
and uh, you know, and it, and, it, and it kind of the idea of looking just down on the ground and seeing all the little specks of cars and stuff, it puts a different perspective on the experience of, you know, being an individual human. At the center of this lifestyle in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, a talented musician named Anthony Matthews loved hang gliding. His friend, Dave Schaffner, was Anthony's bass player on the ground and his wingman in the air. He was a very kind, very gentle person. He was an excellent musician, sang all the greatest hits, uh, all the oldies, um, and then of course he wrote hang gliding songs. That's how we made our living, was playing music. And so you can fly and realize a feeling of freedom with the sky. And he had this really amazing old um, bus that he built up. It kind of made his. It was like I think it had been a school bus originally, and he converted to a to a, a motor home. It had this amazing upper story with a little trap door to go up. It was all, you know, just wild looking with. Uh, Kind of, um, it was like a little sh wood shanty built on top of this bus. Anthony asked, you know, a bunch of these these flyers, you know, David Cronk and uh, Taurus, and um, well, I can't even think of all of them, but just asked if they wanted to come up to Steamboat and fly after uh, after leaving Telluride. Um, and so we had a pretty good caravan of people coming back up from Telluride. It was about an eight hour drive. And we came on up to Steamboat and Anthony got uh, permission um, from the mountain to have all these top hang gliders fly off. And uh, it was definitely a, a dream of his to have, you know, these, these people that he loved and respected, you know, to come to Steamboat Springs and to fly off our mountain. And that was a really amazing ride because it's you know it was a beautiful Colorado Rockies in the summertime with the you know big billowing clouds and occasional thunderstorms and you know, the mountain drama really clear and pretty. So that was that was really neat. And the, with the bus set up the way it was, you could climb out or you climb up through this hatch door into the upper story and then work your way up to the front. And there was a deck on the front of the bus, so you could pretty much sit holding onto this railing with your feet hanging down in front of the windshield of the bus and just, you know, riding along like on a, a moving balcony. And just sit up there and it's really a hoot. So it was a pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable <laughs> journey. <laughs> A few weeks later, Anthony Matthews was dead. Anthony was unable to get into the seat, and he wound up hanging from the cage. He could not pull himself up into the cage, and he was porpoising up and down, unable pretty much to control the glider, and it did look like he was trying to get as low as possible and to fall out over the trees, uh, which is pretty much what he did. It was a big shock because it happened suddenly, it happened immediately, and one day he's here and one day he's gone. And uh, that was a real blow to a lot of us because you know he's such a swell guy, and uh, and for me personally, you know, to be the designer of the plane, it kind of made me feel like some kind of I don't know what kind of responsibility it is, but you know that some kind of feeling. Well, what could I, you know, is there something I could have done differently? That was really a tough time for me, and it was part of my transition from from being really enthusiastic about hang gliding to thinking, well, geez, you know, I'm mortal too, and just the you know, the kind of the joy of it was, was tainted. I had a lot of friends get killed you know, early on in the sport, in the early 70s. 15 or 20 pretty good friends die over that period of time. And that was a very, very sad thing for me. And I think uh, that's probably eventually why I, I kind of faded out, kind of lost interest in the sport. Even though it was a wonderful thing, uh, I had a lot of good friends die. Very sad. 
After a while, I just, uh, I just couldn't continue. Anthony Matthews was not the first to be killed hang gliding, nor the last. In 1977, the unthinkable happened. Bob Wills was killed hang gliding. What finally happened was he was filming a commercial and he hit the downwash from the helicopter and was driven into the ground and basically that's how he died. Bob wasn't my first brother who died hang gliding. My other brother, Eric, had previously died hang gliding. He spent several years working at Will's Wing in the front office. Well, people would come in and say, oh, do you fly hang gliders? And he would have to sheepishly say, uh, no, I don't. Uh, my brothers fly hang gliders. And he, so he decided one day that he wanted to go learn how to fly. And unfortunately, he didn't tell Bobby or me. And he tried to learn on his own. And he crashed and died. You know, when it, it was a terrible tragedy when people started dying. It was, um, it, it, it was painful because something I loved so dearly was killing people. How could you, I couldn't, I, I couldn't get that part. I couldn't rationalize that. Here I had this, this passion and this love for this. I mean, real true love for this activity and for, for what really was a, the, the focal point of my life. And, and, this, and this wonderful thing was killing people. You know, when I started into hang gliding, I'd only been away from Vietnam for about a year or two. And I never knew anyone that died when I was in Vietnam. But it, 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 it struck me as really bizarre. You know, here I was in a war, never, never knew anyone that died, never saw a dead body. And then I get into hang gliding, which is, you know, ostensibly non-combat. <laughs> I meet and then all these, you know, I know all these people that are, that are dead now from hang gliding. You... You do forget the guilties. You think, the way I compared it uh, to myself was, if I hadn't have introduced this sport to America, those people wouldn't, wouldn't have died. If Henry Ford hadn't introduced the car, there's millions of people, hundreds of thousands of people, who wouldn't have died. I don't know that that justifies it, but um, it sort of takes away uh, a lot of the res responsibility of somebody who did something wrong, was telling and pulled the, the guts out of the glider and crashed and died. Um, you can only tell people what to do. In the early days, you could go into a magazine and there was 20, there was 30 different manufacturers and if you really looked into it, you found that 20 of those manufacturers were manufacturing some product that had a serious flaw in it, you know, and uh, no bones about it. I mean, it was just, that was what was there, you know. You, you buy your thing, you take your chances. I've never known anyone with a death wish, and generally the people that actually have a death wish kill themselves. And you don't have to go to the trouble of, of buying a lot of equipment and going through a lot of training and preparation of years and and, and, and all of that to kill yourself. I mean, you know, most people that actually have a death wish kill themselves in, in the most immediate way they can, a gun or, you know, lock themselves in a garage or something. The reason that a lot of people died is that they thought it wasn't dangerous. We all to told each other, it's safe, right? Somebody would whimper a little bit, I'm a little worried. Hey, what are you worried about? It's safe, man, it's safe. We'd all lie to each other and then, you know, then we'd go hammer in. I don't think anyone willingly made unsafe gliders. I don't think, I, I, just, I just think it happened. And I think that we pushed the limits of the operating envelope on the gliders. In a way, we were like fighter pilots in that we lost a lot of friends and that came as part of the game. If you were going to stay on the cutting edge, if you were going to be competitive, if you were going to venture into unflown spaces, you took those risks. And a lot of good pilots and nice people paid for that with their lives. And that is probably the greatest sorrow that I carry.
Hang gliding in the early days was very much like war. So it, it was almost to the point where uh, you were afraid to talk to any of your friends. Because any time you talked to one of your friends, you heard about another of your friend who had died. And I at first started by assigning one finger to each person that I knew that had died in a hang glider. And it was not long before I ran out of fingers and ran out of toes. By June of 1974, membership in the United States Hang Gliding Association had passed 10,000 and was growing at a rate of 500 new members a month. Control and regulation of this sport with its elusive participants would be a challenge for a ponderous regulatory agency such as the Federal Aviation Administration. A board member of the Soaring Society of America saw a resolution for this concern and drafted a proposal to the Federal Aviation Administration. The FAA adopted it almost word for word, making the sport self-regulating. The next step taken was for pilot proficiency. The United States Hang Gliding Association developed a hang rating system for pilots. These hang badges were awarded according to the pilot's skill level. So USHGA set up its hang badge rating system. But because USHGA or its affiliates in the form of clubs or members were in charge of practically every flying site in the United States, they could pretty well impose these uh, hang ratings on anybody who flew from their sites. And that's how it was self-regulated. And I think considering all the great possibility for problems in that area, it worked out quite well. While the training and hang rating process for pilots went relatively quickly, it took longer for the Hang Glider Manufacturers Association to develop solutions for the basically unstable Regalo wing. The early uh, Regalos had a tendency of, of uh, when they got into too much of a dive, they would, the, the sail would start to flap or luff like on a sailboat and they tended to lock into this sort of luffing thing and there really wasn't anything the pilot could do except uh, you know, hang on for the ride. Well, I think the thing that we were all looking for is that we realized that we had to have some sort of safety standards and some sort of testing. And I think that that's for our own safety and the good of the sport and everybody that was flying in it, we realized that we really had to, you know, upgrade this thing and make it as, as safe as we possibly could. We didn't really have any established test methods. We didn't know how to fly the higher performance gliders, and the gliders themselves at certain times were quite unsafe. That's how hang gliding got early on a pretty bad reputation in the public eye. And to be honest, justifiably, because we were having equipment failure. Flight itself is uh, adventurous enough without having equipment failure. And to me, that was when the big change in, uh, in the sport came, was when we started having proper testing methods. And I think the great leap forward was the creation of the Hang Glider Manufacturers Association. Everybody wanted to have a, a, a safer glider. Tom Price had worked as an engineer in structural mechanics, working on the DC-8, DC-9, and DC-10. I had always wanted to do real aerodynamic loads and, and we had to know stability, and the only way to do stability outside of flight test was uh, the equivalent to a wind tunnel. We didn't have a wind tunnel, so we built a structure on top of a vehicle and drove the gliders down the road to get at real speeds to measure stability. Well, you can also measure the structure, the, the loading of, an, of a glider uh, with that method. We, we built this test rig, and uh, we tested my early gliders on it, and then we invited the industry, the local Southern California industry, down to San Diego County for a test party. I think there are about five companies represented, and we uh, were on a little road out in San Diego County somewhere, test, uh, do a stability test and break in gliders. I was present during the first weekend when we started testing hang gliders and it came as close to losing my life 
when we were testing some of the gliders because when they uh, went negative and slammed down, we almost pulled the rig off the top and the control bar almost threw me off because we weren't tied down. Each manufacturer submitted a certification package for review to the Hang Glider Manufacturers Association. As a result of this testing, the gliders themselves became stable, strong, and easy to control. With trained and rated pilots flying certified gliders, the death toll diminished rapidly. A third development that also helped keep the fatalities in check was the parachute. Several groups started developing a parachute recovery system at the same time, involving Roy Haggard, Jim Hanbury, Chuck Embry, and Rich Piccarilli. It was virtually impossible for the pilot of a broken hang glider to bail out in a conventional sense, so a hand-deployed parachute system was developed that brought the pilot and glider down safely together. A lot of parachute jumpers got into hang gliding because it was like the next step or the next uh, uh, adventuresome thing to do. I made a bunch of parachute jumps from hang gliders, but I didn't expect my friends to do that, you know. So I took what I knew about parachuting. I'm an FAA uh, master parachute rigger, and I, I put a parachute in an envelope uh, that wouldn't open until it was 25 feet away from the glider, and then it would let the glider and the pilot down at the same time. So uh, I had to come up with a system that would be uh, fail-safe or foolproof that would uh, save lives. The flexible wing gliders of today bear little resemblance to the gliders of the 1970s. Today's gliders are the product of more than three decades of refinement and innovative developments. So-called blade wing gliders of today incorporate many of the innovative features that designer Bob Trampanaw pioneered in the 1970s. The gliders of today are sleek, fast, and strong. They are as safe as any other aircraft. The performance of these highly refined and sophisticated wings is truly remarkable. Hang gliders have soared to over 20,000 feet, and the world distance record for hang gliding currently stands at over 400 miles. By the late 70s, pilot training, glider certification, and the use of parachutes all contributed to making hang gliding a safe form of flying. With sophisticated equipment and regulated flying sites came increased costs and fewer new pilots. The golden age of modern hang gliding was coming to an end. Competition was becoming serious, and manufacturers shared less with each other. Quite a few hang gliding pioneers were drawn to the new ultralights, which were basically hang gliders with motors added. Sadly, many who survived the early days of hang gliding perished in ultralight accidents, for the same reasons early hang gliders crashed. In hang gliding, the flying wing finally found its place in aviation. The recovery parachutes developed for hang gliders have evolved into rescue systems for general aviation. The hang gliding pioneers took great risk to fulfill their dreams of flying like a bird. The consequences were unknown at the outset, the rewards very personal. Hang gliding has really made a big difference in my life. You got in it, you interacted with uh, exciting people, and you began seeing what you could do with small, inexpensive airplanes. And as I look back, it was those days of hang gliding enthusiasm that became the real reason that the company is devoted to doing more with less. 
what captured uh, all our imaginations is, was the freedom of the portability and the freedom of it. Not only the freedom of the, of the feeling of flight, but the freedom of the concept too, to be able to have an aircraft that you could take just about anywhere and fly off a hill or fly off a mountain or fly off a cliff. Yeah, that, that kind of freedom. We got in his pickup truck and went, God, I, I don't know how many miles up into the mountains, but I mean, we were really out there alone. We took off and immediately hooked in uh, some pretty good thermals and began screwing up to cloud base. And we climbed and climbed and climbed. And it was so incredible because when we got up to cloud base, here were all these other guys flying around out there like pterodactyls. And uh, it was pretty special. I had to give up flying as a pursuit in my mid-30s because I suffered a left bundle branch heart block. Every fall I go up on Hawk Hill here overlooking the Golden Gate to watch the hawk migration. So that's where I get my soaring these days is by watching birds. The joy that I got when I see somebody that's a new pilot come in and land, you know, he's yelling and jumping and screaming and, you know, uh, it's an experience that he's, he, he, he could only imagine before. Now he's realized it. Once you commit to fly, you know, I mean, it's, it's important. What you do in your own reaction and your judgments is, is your life, you know. It's, it's not, not difficult to kill yourself when you're flying. Not difficult at all. So it brings a focus into your life, which carries through with everything you do. So it, it, um, it changes you definitely. Definitely. Hang gliding was a wonderful experience. So it's part of my blood, it's part of my, uh, my being. Hang gliding has affected my life in a way that it'd be very difficult for me to separate the two. If I don't pay attention and focus and do what I've been taught to do, I can die. And to overcome that fear, to face that fear, and challenge yourself on that level, and do it and accomplish it, changes a person forever. And so we lived our dream. The journey enriched our lives, touched our souls. We encountered unforeseen consequences, made lifelong friends, and suffered great loss. In the end, we soared to unimaginable heights on wings built from ancient dreams in a big blue sky.